Hei tīmata, he karakia, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, he hiake ane te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Tēnā tātou, a ko Callan Jones tōku ingoa, he uri a hau o Ngāti Kahununu. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Cowan Jones. I'm a co-editor of the Māori Law Review and I'm delighted to be chairing this session today. This is part of a series which has been organised by the Māori Law Review uh, in association with our friends at the Aotearoa uh, New Zealand Indig Centre for Indigenous Peoples in the Law. And this series is aiming to focus in on the experiences of Indigenous peoples uh, in the context of, of COVID-19 and government responses to the uh, global pandemic, and particularly aiming to pick up on issues of law and justice. And in this particular session today, uh, we're going to be focusing in on the experiences of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Uh, and we've got a fantastic panel, I'm really pleased, to, to have uh, the, the, the range of uh, people and experiences uh, that we have on this panel today. Uh, I'll introduce each of them to you uh, and then we'll move into, um, each of them will have an opportunity to, to talk for a, a short time and pick up on some particular issues. So first we'll, uh, in, I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking. So we'll first hear from Courtney Sky. Uh, and Courtney is of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Uh, she's a research fellow with the Yellowhead Institute. Uh, she's led policy development for the public sector at local, provincial, national levels with a particular focus on youth development and ending violence against Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. And her work focuses on the promotion of the political mobilization of Indigenous women trans, non-binary and two-spirit people to create transformational change in communities. Um, she's also the co-host of a, a podcast, the Red Road podcast, which I encourage you to um, seek out as well. So welcome Courtney and we'll, we'll come to you in a moment uh, for your thoughts and comments. Our second speaker uh, will be uh, Professor John Burrows. Uh, John is uh, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, is Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria Law School. He's held a no number of other um, prestigious academic positions. Uh, he's published widely on, on issues relating to Indigenous peoples and particularly uh, issues relating to constitutional law. Uh, he's an award-winning author of a number of books and I think most recently is Law's Indigenous Ethics and John is Anishinaabe uh, and a member of the Chippewa, the Nawash First Nation in Ontario. So welcome, John. And then we will uh, hear from uh, Chiwagilak, Jess Hausty. Uh, Jess is of the Heltsik Nation. Uh, she's involved in community organizing, has a long history of involvement in community organizing and grassroots project. Uh, she has served on the HealthSick Tribal Council and that's included uh, a number of external appointments to regional boards and committees on behalf of the HealthSick Nation. She's worked as a freelance writer, educator and consultant on a uh, number of different community projects. She's deeply committed to community engagement and decolonial approaches uh, and we'll hear from her um, she'll be our third speaker today. Welcome, Jess. And then our fourth and final uh, speaker will be uh, Jeff Corntassel. So Jeff is of the Cherokee Nation and he's based now in, in Canada. Uh, he's at the University of uh, Victoria. He's an Associate Professor in Indigenous Studies there and his research and teaching uh, relates to Indigenous political movements, community resurgence, and sustainable self-determination. Uh, he, he's also published widely on these topics. He's, he has a 
uh, excellent book, Forced Federalism, Contemporary Challenges to Indigenous Nationhood, um, as well as uh, being involved in editing other works and publishing um, numerous articles which focused on issues relating to uh, indigeneity, to uh, self-determination, uh, insurgent education, uh, reconciliation efforts as they impact indigenous peoples um, in different uh, countries and jurisdictions. So welcome all and thank you very much for making yourselves available to participate in this series uh, and without any further uh, introductions we'll um, pass over to Courtney to speak with us. Awesome, thank you. I'm going to share my screen and start the slideshow. So I've prepared a, um, a number of slides just to talk about some of the research that I've done um, regarding uh, COVID data that's available to uh, publicly available uh, COVID data in Canada. So um, this work focuses on publicly accessible data uh, data that makes it easier for Indigenous people to seek accountability from leaders, both in the um, public health side of um, interventions and responses to COVID, but also um, all levels of government, including our own in Indigenous governance systems. Uh, this research is, um, was born out of some of the responses in early May that happened in Canada regarding COVID-19 and uh, a notice discrepancy and the experiences of community reporting data at a much uh, greater rate than what the federal government was making available. So um, in our Yellowhead report, um, we found uh, in the five provinces um, that were reporting in, uh, in First Nations cases of COVID, uh, communities were reporting a, a greater significance. So um, here you can see with the yellow, just how many more uh, cases there were in each of the specific provinces. Um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to focus on only five provinces, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Quebec. Um, the, the federal government has not released any indigenous COVID data um, on a daily basis from any of the territories or maritime provinces. Um, so here's a little bit more um, in-depth data. You can see how um, only certain regions are represented. And on May, uh, May 10th, um, we found that there were nearly 500 cases of reported COVID data compared to 175 cases. So why is there a data discrepancy? So there's no agency or organization in Canada that's reliably recording um, or reporting uh, indigenous COVID data. And um, there's no reliable data collection. This is true for a number of different service areas that exist and kind of where I enter into the health sphere with my work on uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and, and working with children and youth. Um, there's no really reliable identifying um, or disaggregated data that's available in Canada across many service sectors. And this became evident in how um, early COVID data was being reported. Um, you know, Canada cannot tell you on a daily basis how many Indigenous kids are in care. Um, the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women cannot identify the total number of Indigenous women that are missing or have been murdered in the country. And Canada cannot accurately tell you today um, how many Indigenous people have COVID-19. Uh, so comparing over time since then, um, what's happened with uh, data since we reported this uh, or made this information available. So again, on the day we released the report, um, Indigenous Services Canada reported 175 cases uh, and Yellowhead report indicated there was uh, 465 cases. Um, we did another check-in with the data on May 27th. Uh, Indigenous Services Canada continued to use their same methodology, indicating that there were 212 cases and six deaths. Um, Yellowhead reported um, over 600 cases and uh, 12 community reported deaths. Um, and then the latest date that we have information available for um, here in Canada is from last Friday, August 28th, 
and um, Indigenous Services Canada was reporting 438 cases and six deaths, which is approaching about where we were at the beginning of the outbreak with some of the Yellowhead reported data. Um, because of the changes that have happened in reporting, uh, lack of increase in transparency, um, today we really have no idea how many Indigenous uh, cases there are or even community reported cases because there's just been a significant drop off in the number of media reports around uh, people who have died um, from COVID-19 um, and uh, a no greater increase in the number of communities that are um, reporting information around cases. Um, there's also been a big discrepancy in the number of communities that are identified. Um, but we estimate there's around um, 60 different Indigenous communities that um, have had um, cases of COVID-19. Uh, I wanted to include just one example of what it looks like when a community does have control over local public health. Uh, this is my home community, Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, and throughout um, the COVID-19 pandemic, our community has been doing things such as this, um, releasing um, information and um, data around what our local cases relate to um, in comparison to our surrounding uh, communities. So Six Nations is located in uh, Southern Ontario. It's located next to um, some very uh, large uh, settler populations that have had very significant outcomes breaks, including um, in Hagersville, which is in Haldeman, Norfolk County, which saw a, a very large outbreak in a residential care facility. And so um, we can see that, you know, communities are working to uh, make sure that data is available uh, for communities and that um, that community interventions and having control has actually resulted in Six Nations having a significantly lower um, case results than even our surrounding areas. Um, Six Nations has about uh, 14,000 band members that live in the community. So they've um, been doing quite well. And they did interventions such as closing borders of the reserve to um, external uh, people. So what has been the impact? Um, I really believe that data is fundamental to making informed policy decisions. And so when we see this under representation of, um, you know, what the prevalence is, what the ability of communities is to respond, um, we see a decision making that doesn't really reflect uh, what communities need. Uh, so recently the federal government has announced $112 million for First Nations school preparedness. Uh, this falls much lower than the estimated $1 billion budget that uh, was indicated was needed uh, by the Assembly of First Nations. And so um, it's still concerning that we're not seeing the amount of investment that's needed for a response and that the infrastructure around how data is made available to communities is, is increased as our uh, country prepares for additional waves of the pandemic. That's uh, it for my presentation right now. I'm um, looking forward to having a conversation with the other panelists. Great, thanks Courtney. Um, and certainly I mean, the experience here too is very much um, one into about thinking about the data that's, that's collected and uh, what that tells us about um, how visible or how prioritised uh, Indigenous peoples issues are here for a, a long while. At the beginning of this outbreak there wasn't ethnicity data being collected for example and as you say that makes it very hard to to make um, good sound evidence-based decisions um, and there's also the issue there I think that you raised is really important about thinking about how um, to have Indigenous communities can be resourced to uh, to exercise their own decision making and exercise their self determination around um, understanding their own community needs and delivering on those and protecting their, their communities within this this period as well um, and, and those are all issues which which have have uh, have come up in the context of, of Aotearoa and, and uh, Maori here too. 
Thank you very much for that. Let's turn now um, to um, John Burroughs. We'll talk a little bit about the role of Indigenous law in keeping communities safe. It's really good to be with you and I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this. Um, one of the things I've been impressed with is how Indigenous peoples are using their self-determination to deal with this emergency that's upon us. Um, there are many communities that have passed a variety of types of laws that have locked down their community, uh, declared an emergency, and then uh, patrolled the borders to allow for emergency um, access and food to come into the community, but not allow those that don't have a particular reason for being there to be a part of the uh, um, sort of traffic going back and forth out of the community. And so as I was um, looking from coast to coast to coast, I was seeing a lot of this in uh, written form. And uh, you often find that there's a lot of notice given, um, that uh, there's a lot of discussion and counseling together that's a part of the formulation of the law. Um, there's modifications of the law that will happen as the community gains experience with uh, their safety uh, through time. Um, one of the things that I've been impressed with is the way that they've tried to um, invigorate some of the traditional structures in relationship to the engagement of folks uh, through clans and family groups, as well as through you know, band council committees and, uh, and those kinds of um, uh, more uh, Western-based ways that uh, we have in our place. Um, so the, the idea that we can turn to our own laws to manage this uh, challenge has been quite encouraging to me. I think some of that uh, responsiveness comes to the pre-existing experiences that we have with pandemics, uh, uh, the uh, um, S1A, uh, uh, the, just through time, there's been so much that we've had to face with the respiratory diseases. And uh, so people were pretty quick off the mark as a result. Um, one of the things that has been really hopeful for me is to see that this isn't just um, locking down and uh, preventing access, but there's been uh, a lot of um, mutual aid and help for one another. And so uh, in, in my community, um, Chippewa of the Nawash, uh, I'm not home. I'm way across the country not right now in British Columbia, but I talk to my family quite frequently. There has been uh, people delivering um, whitefish and deer and uh, leeks and morale in season uh, to uh, my, my mother, who's an elder, and my sister, who um, is her caregiver in that situation. There is a food bank in the community. Uh, you can uh, order or um, um, just not have to go off to the reserve by um, going into the uh, community center itself. And there's, it's all set up in such a way that people can receive food in a, a safe fashion. Um, the other kinds of care that was there is there've been parades that have gone through uh, just down the road as people are trying to address the mental health and isolation that's a part of that. Uh, there's been you know, activity in uh, different um, on the land opportunities with fishing and hunting, not just talking about my own community now, but people getting out and trying to revitalize some of those other ways of of dealing with our food security uh, by ensuring that we're social distance, but we're, you know, you can do that often when you're on the land or on the water as the case might be. Um, so there's a lot of things that I see that Indigenous law is being used to deal with uh, these challenges. Um, the thing that's encouraging to me too is that I can see some of the our seven uh, grandmother, grandfather teachings involved here. Anishinaabe people talk about uh, love and truth, uh, bravery, wisdom, honesty, humility, um, etc. I, I see a kind of a gentleness, a taking care of one another, uh, a help, a mutual aid, as I mentioned a second ago. But we are complicated people. And so the other side of this is uh, we have a lot of mental health challenges, a lot of addiction issues, a lot of violence issues that are in our homes that are anything but uh, the love, truth, bravery, courage. And I think uh, that has been 
heightened in this period. And uh, our, our own community, other communities that I've been working with are, are thinking about passing laws that deal with um, those that are dealing drugs on the community, in the community, and what could be done to um, address the, the death and, the, um, and the, the sadness that's happening in the wake of, of those addictions, uh, especially the, those that are dealing in uh, the drugs. So councils and communities are putting their minds to um, uh, that in a, in a heightened way, more than I've seen before. Uh, on the, the violence front, uh, I think this is the point that Courtney was making earlier. Um, the idea that this is happening needs to be further understood uh, through data and further um, projected through our communities. Uh, people know this is going on, but I don't see the same kind of response to the violence, um, uh, particularly against Indigenous women and children uh, that I see, for instance, with the violence that uh, is happening with uh, the, the opioid crisis and fentanyl, et cetera, as people are, are just really being devastated through that front. Uh, we need to do more on that violence front. And then um, on the mental health side, there's been money uh, set aside. Uh, uh, money is coming from the government as well. Um, my sister who works in mental health in our community, she has her PhD in the field. Uh, she's regularly there on staff. I know she's facing questions that are, are, are pronounced. She doesn't tell me any of the details at all. She's very uh, professional in the way that she approaches her practice. Uh, but I get the sense that um, there, is a res there is resources there. Those resources are being deployed, but um, the resources to help people are not sufficient to match the need uh, that we have. So what I'm saying is there's a lot of great news out there. Indigenous self-determination is being used through our laws uh, to deal with the food and the emergency question. It's also being dealt with uh, through the addiction issues, the mental health issues, but there's so much more to do on the mental health front, the uh, drugs uh, front, the addictions front, and then of course the violence front as well. And this is why we need our law. Our law is there uh, not uh, just to go halfway, but to deal with all of the challenges that we face. And my hope is that we can turn to increasingly the things that we're seeing when we've been successful in dealing with this, to deal with these more long-term pervasive issues that we have that are, are, are really tough for our families uh, and uh, for, for individuals who are facing these issues. And, and then now just speaking personally at the end here, this is the first time I've not been home in 35 years. Uh, this is a powwow season. It's like a family reunion time. There's ceremonies that are done at this time of year. And we have a real rotating um, population. People just don't stay on the reserve. They go out for education and work and sociality, uh, et cetera. And, and that, that annual round has been stopped. And there's uh, significant implications for those that are on the reserve that don't get to visit um, their families and cousins and those of us off the reserve who feel that missing piece uh, this year. And uh, I, I know that uh, that is something that is going to be affecting us for some time as well. And so just uh, trying to present a, a, a bunch of views here. Um, nuances, sacred, beware the danger of a single story. Hopefully you get the sense here. There's a lot of good going on, but also a lot of challenge. So miigwech, thank you for this opportunity to be able to talk a little bit about this. Thanks, John. Um, and again, a lot, a lot there that, that resonates with the experience of Maori here in Aotearoa at the moment, particularly in thinking about both the challenges and the, the, um, some of the quite positive things we've seen in terms of uh, they re responding by turning to our, our own practices and our own law to engage in this, in this, with this new challenge, but, um, but drawing on the experience we've had with similar challenges in the past. And as you say, there's also um, a lot that's had to be done to adjust and adapt our practices, um, particularly around ones which which have had a real social focus and have 
generally involve people coming together. We've had to think about other ways of, of doing that through this this time. Some some um, really important issues there that that we're keen to um, come back to if we get a chance and and, um, and talk about a little bit further as well. Okay, let's move now to uh, to. Jess, who, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the community responses um, in her own community. There, unmuted. Thank you. Um, Brevity is not my strong point, so I might talk fast. Um, yo, my name is uh, Chihuahua, Jess Hosty. On my mother's side, I'm a citizen of the Helsinki Nation. Uh, I have ties to the East Date tribe through my late grandfather and to the Hoyat people, where a creation story comes from through my grandmother. On my father's side, I come from mixed settler ancestry. I was incredibly blessed to grow up in my homelands, um, which stretch from the mainland through outer coastal islands to open ocean uh, in an area that most people know is the central coast of British Columbia. Um, our territory is quite large. It's over 35,000 square kilometers. And uh, our community of Bella Bella is the largest community on the Central Coast. So for a little bit of context, the knowledge that we hold from our ancestors tells us that pre-contact, our people numbered over 10,000. We lived in more than 50 known uh, seasonal and permanent villages throughout our territory. But after contact and waves of smallpox and influenza, our people at their lowest point numbered 197. In the wake of that devastation, survivors from villages across our territory and tribal groups congregated at a central location in Bella Bella in the early 1900s. So the history of Bella Bella as a community is really rooted in survival of epidemics. Um, today, Helsinki people number around 3,000. About half of our people live in our homelands and about half are dispersed in urban environments in the territories of other nations. And even today, most families who live in the territory are still really heavily dependent on marine and intertidal foods to sustain their families and heavily dependent on the sustainable economies that they practice out on the land. So in my community, I play two different roles. Uh, my day job is that I'm the executive director of Cux Project Society, which is a health charitable nonprofit that's been operating community-led programs for youth and families out on the land for the last 22 years. Um, I've also served my community for two terms as an elected tribal councillor and health tribal council. And I came to that elected political work eight and a half years ago when I was in my mid twenties and really deeply involved in community organizing around the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline which was a proposed pipeline meant to travel from the Alberta tar sands to the north coast of BC. And the shipping routes associated with that project would have brought super tankers laden with crude oil dangerously close to our territorial waters, putting everything we are as healthy people at risk. And you know, the fight to stop that project really is what drove the first five years of my work at the council table. And that project was eventually halted, uh, largely due to the incredible work done by so many nations across BC and Alberta. Um, I continued to work in support of community leadership and stewardship, uh, both in my nonprofit and my political capacity. And I, I really want to touch on a particular incident that I think really galvanized our community work in a crucial way, just as a bit of context for you know, the COVID conversation. So, in October 2016, an American-owned tug and barge in transit from Alaska to Washington ran aground just north of Bella Bella. Um, it spilled around 110,000 liters of diesel and around 5,000 liters of heavy oil into an area of our territory that our people know as the breadbasket of our community. These waters around Gale Creek and Seaforth Passage are the location where our people still you know, up until the spill, harvested dozens of marine and intertidal species that feed virtually every home in Bella Bella, and which more than 50 families depend on for economic security in the form of the commercial clam harvest alone. I won't belabor that story, um, except to say that, you know, the late autumn storms really complicated the containment of the spilled fuel and the whole response effort. Virtually none of the fuel was recovered. The emergency phase lasted for 40 really grueling days with hundreds of health sick citizens working alongside professional spill responders. Um, health sick were initially excluded from the unified command team that was overseeing the spill response on behalf of the provincial and federal government and the polluter. And when we successfully fought for our sovereign nation and our deep local knowledge to be at the forefront of the spill response, I was one of the incident commanders who represented our nation at that table. 
which is the most dubious job title I've ever had. Um, it was a devastating experience for our community. You know, after years and years of fighting the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline on the basis of the risk it posed to our waters and our entire identity as Helsinki people, and more than that, you know, on the heels of millennia of careful stewardship of our homelands going back to time before memory, watching this disaster unfold in front of us with so little we could do was, was just traumatic. And, you know, as I think everyone on this panel would intuitively know, the impacts of an oil spill are not just environmental and ecological, they're economic. We had families who lost the ability to support themselves, they're social and emotional. You know, today, still, we're grappling with the trauma of that experience in our community. You know, the impacts are spiritual, they're sacred places in our territory where we can no longer practice our ceremonies. And the impacts on food security are particularly devastating. And, you know, speaking for myself, it, it still haunts me to think that my ancestors cared for this place for tens of thousands of years and on my watch this happened and nothing I did in the aftermath seemed to make any difference and I came out the other side of that disaster feeling broken and incapable and I wasn't I wasn't alone um, and so in the spring of 2017 about six months after the oil spill I was still really grappling with a lot of fear and anger and I could see it in the community all around me and I didn't know what to do. None of us knew what to do. Um, but what became my path to healing was the act of growing food. So what we did was we transformed a vacant lot in the center of Bella Bella into a layas, a garden. Uh, we started off with around 30 raised beds and for me planting them and weeding them and harvesting food to give away to the community gave me a sense of agency and control that I hadn't felt since this bill. What I really needed at that point was just that linear process of planting a seed and watching it grow and then handing a zucchini or a bundle of carrots to someone in the community knowing it was going to fill their belly. Um, you know, of course, there's no way that fruits and vegetables and herbs could ever replace the marine and intertidal resources that we lost in the spill. Uh, but what, when we built the Layas, we wanted it to be a calm and beautiful and welcoming space for health spill responders. And we wanted it to be a place where we could teach some hard skills around growing and preserving food. Because one of the things that was really reinforcing the trauma we were experiencing was that we needed to find a rhythm again. And for me and for many others, um, gardening was really part of what helped to give us that rhythm back. So from 2017 through 2019, our food security work in the community grew to support a couple dozen local families who wanted to learn how to grow food. Uh, our nonprofit, Pack Society, worked in partnership with our local health center to jointly staff our LIAS and to also tend to small gardens at our school and our elders building. We ran a few workshops every year to teach gardening skills and share resources with the community. And you know, we saw the number of people who were participating slowly rise from year to year. And then spring of this year happened and the pandemic, pandemic was suddenly you know, causing just shocking changes to our daily lives here. You know, our community is the center of our universe, but it's geographically really distant from you know, the suppliers that we rely on for freight. And those supply chains suddenly start to feel really tenuous when you're looking at all of these things unfolding in the wider world. You know, we have one small hospital with a single ventilator, which was not and could not be prepared to handle a large scale outbreak. We were seeing really rapid changes to our, our behaviors and norms in the community um, that really were bringing back and uprooting that sense of fear and anxiety and bringing it back into the community. Um, that sort of sense of powerlessness and inevitability that for me was really reminiscent of the oil spill. And I really want to acknowledge um, the points that Courtney was making around data and the extent to which failure to report and disclose critical information was really problematic for HealthSick when we were trying to plan locally informed um, responses for our people. And just like with the spill, you know, we really saw that the provincial and federal government were not the ones showing up for us. It was our neighboring nations and it was us ourselves who were looking deep and, and drawing down that power to find a way through this pandemic. Um, so, you know, in, March, April, you know, I could really feel my mental health starting to spiral. I could see it in people around me. None of the really deeply community focused land based programs we would normally be running out of our nonprofit felt possible in the context of a pandemic. But as a nonprofit organization, you know, we're an organization that strives to really meet our community where it's at and evolve to provide the support they ask for when they need it. 
And so as it turned out, what that looked like in spring of this year was just more gardening done differently. So where we would normally have a team of youth working together in those community garden spaces, we developed individual champions for each different community garden so that we could still grow food at scale to give away to our community. And that work was really integrated with our social development department who was able to help ensure that that food got to the people who needed it most. Uh, where we would normally run workshops in person to teach hard skills to a couple dozen families. Um, we launched social media channels to provide instruction and support. We broadcast audio tutorials on Hellsick FM radio. Um, we started doing one-on-one -on -one video chats with local gardeners who needed some help. We really leaned on our suppliers in the wider world and our support networks to bring in just heaps more supplies than we would normally need. And we started to distribute soil and seed kits and planters to any household in Bella Bella who wanted to participate. And so by April, we had built a small greenhouse to master its seedlings to grow away. And by May, our list had grown from a couple of dozen casually interested families to over 80 avid families who were putting their whole hearts into what they were growing. And we decided to call the pandemic food security program Granny Gardens. Um, like Victory Gardens, we wanted to elevate gardening beyond the simple act of growing food and really build community around what we were doing, but we didn't really like the you know, imperialist undertones of a name like Victory Gardens. Uh, and we wanted to really firmly root our work in the knowledge that our ancestors, contrary to hunter-gatherer myths, were gardeners. They cared for clam gardens and berry orchards and root gardens. They held deep and intimate knowledge of the systems and species and techniques that would enable our people and our homelands to thrive. And they carried that knowledge through natural disasters and famines and floods and even through epidemics, and they survived and we're the inheritors of that legacy. And at a time when there's so much heaviness and uncertainty permeating the world around us, it's really calming and empowering for me to feel that I'm doing work that my ancestors made possible and that I'm supporting others to do it too. This is just one aspect of the pandemic related food security work that people are engaged in. And John touched on a lot of you know, really wonderful initiatives that are happening in other communities that are, are present here too. And we're supporting local harvesters to go out and um, gather resources to distribute to the community. We're leaning on our trade relationships with other nations um, for mutual aid and sharing resources. We're looking at how we can revitalize those deeper systems of ancestral gardening of wild plants and wild species to reintroduce more of that element to our diets. And as I think Jeff is going to talk more about next, um, we really fought to ensure that sport fishing lodges, which are really an abhorrent form of trophy hunting, um, remained closed to prevent dual damage that we were worried about, you know, increased risk of COVID exposure and increased pressure on the food species we rely on. And so for me, at the heart of all of this is a sense of really deep comfort and pride in how the food systems work that was catalyzed by the pandemic has really deepened our relationships with neighboring nations as we support one another through COVID-19 and how our community is willing to put in the hard work of decentralized and decolonial approaches to food systems resiliency. So it's moving beyond food security and toward food sovereignty. Um, you know, I see families who are sharing seeds and trading produce and exchanging carrots for smoked fish and, you know, dropping off meals of homegrown ingredients to elders. And all of this to me is, is watching our people call our power back to ourselves in new ways, focusing on community self-reliance and community care. And in, in the context of a pandemic, it's a really beautiful thing to see. You know, it's an oversimplification to say that an oil spill gave us a garden and a pandemic really catalyzed it to grow. But truly, I've never seen my people stand in their own power more than I see right now. Uh, in spite of all of those challenges uh, that you know John highlighted, um, I just I see so much power and willingness to to boldly address them. And I think this is just one little glimpse into how we're doing it here. Uh, and it's growing. It's growing, and I'm really privilege now to even be assisting work to scope out the idea of a, a regional food hub that prioritizes indigenous food systems knowledge so that we can take this proven resilience and protect and enhance it on a coast-wide scale, even beyond the context of the pandemic. Uh, so that's a lot of winding information and I'm sure I've gone way over my time. Um, Gayasika for inviting me to share some of that story with you alongside so many amazing panelists. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jess, for sharing that. That's, um, I think that's a really 
I mean, for, for me anyway, I, I, that's a really great example of thinking about how communities are building on their past experiences and their challenges and drawing on, on the knowledge and, and values that have been handed down to, to respond to these new challenges and to, to, as you say, to build up those networks, to build up um, those systems of resilience. So uh, that's really uh, great to hear that, that, that story, how that unfolded in your community. Um, let's turn to uh, Jeff Corntassel now. To I think Jeff's going to pick up on some of the issues of food security as well, and I'll, I'll hand over to you, Jeff. Hello, Karen and Osio uh, Nigata. So Jeff Ganohalito Corntassel Dagwadoa. So my name is Jeff Corntassel. I'm from Cherokee Nation, as you mentioned. Uh, my Cherokee name is Ganohalito, and I dance at the Achota Grounds. I'm part of the Achota Grounds and in uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma, in the United States. And uh, similar to what uh, was shared earlier, I think John mentioned, I haven't been able to get back for ceremony this year. So it's been really difficult. And we kind of improvised. So my daughter and I danced around a fire uh, for about 25 minutes. Normally it would be all night uh, to celebrate the harvest. And um, we had uh, some food there and and we broke our fast and and kind of danced in solidarity with our our, um, our Cherokee brothers and sisters who were in Oklahoma. So um, yeah, I think this is a really uh, interesting challenge, but it's not unique as I think Jess and Courtney and John all pointed out. And I, the way I see it, we're facing two different pandemics: the one of ongoing colonization and the other of COVID-19. And I think of these as both needing uh, desperate need of vaccinations. And so when we think of, you know, what does a vaccine look like? Uh, we think of those, those acts of self-determination. And I was thinking as Jess was speaking, uh, one of the things that I've been doing here is worked with Cheryl Bryce a bit on food security issues. And uh, basically, we've kept this small group going, uh, doing social distancing uh, gardening. And so to, to really facilitate the, the community gardens at Songhees First Nation and really, you know, keep this going despite the odds of, you know, trying to get us all together. And so gardening differently, I really like the way Jess uh, talked about that and thinking of different ways that we can grow foods and we're trading seeds in different ways, you know? Uh, so I'm trading some Cherokee plants with folks from Songhees and, and vice versa. And so we're sharing this, this food and it's, a, I, as I see it, a kind of a deepening of our old trade networks uh, and they just look differently now. And so, yeah, I think, you know, the, the self-determination uh, aspect is really important and, and I think the ability to for nations to to close off their borders or restrict entry is such a key part of this. And I, you know, as I think Jess mentioned and John mentioned as well, the the ability to uh, protect their communities from uh, encroachment, you know, from from folks that are coming from the outside. And you know, Haida Gwaii has probably been one of the most prominent, but it's happened in Jess's you know, nation in Heltzik, it's happened in New Channel, uh, you know, nations, all 14 of those nations have restricted or, or, or uh, challenged the ability for tourists to enter into their territory. And this is where we see the real innovations of different indigenous nations and their approaches. I know for uh, some of the communities in a house it, uh, they deputize some of the citizens so that they could actually patrol the area and, and keep the, the community safe. Um, and in other ways, you know, communities are saying, and they're standing up to, in Haida Gwaii, standing up to the Queen Charlotte Lodge and the other fishing lodges who are opening, as I see it, illegally uh, on indigenous territory. And I think part of this reflects um, a lack of free prior and informed consent around a reopening strategy in the province and even across Canada, right? Thinking about how that notion of free prior and informed consent hasn't really been extended 
when talking about uh, indigenous nations and their needs and their self-determining authority, especially to allow or not allow people into their territory. Uh, with, with Haida Gwaii, um, you know, we saw these pretty um, dramatic videos of Queen Charlotte Lodge boaters and other, other folks basically running into the, uh, running through the waters and fishing as, as if there was no pandemic and in the face of Haida authority. And so uh, eventually, you know, after uh, much pressure put on the province and much pressure put on the Queen Charlotte Lodge, uh, the, you know, John Horgan and others closed uh, the Haida borders, but that's ultimately for the Haida nation to determine. And so I think we need um, a better recognition and in, in a sense, Indigenous peoples are doing this, an assertion of the self-determining authority um, in, in order to, to promote the health and well-being of Indigenous nations. The, uh, the other thing I was going to mention when I talked about these two different forms of colonization is, you know, we've seen that uh, what Canada considers to be essential services really differs markedly from what I think as Indigenous peoples we see as essential. Uh, and so essential services right now involve workers on Site C Dam. It involves workers at the Coastal Gas Link. Uh, continuing the pipeline, the Trans-Canada Pipeline, all of which are being challenged by First Nations. And so uh, this is another aspect of, uh, you know, in basically enforcing Indigenous laws on Indigenous lands. Um, I, I won't go on too long, but I think, you know, in the States, and I, I really appreciated what Courtney said, uh, in the States, we also have kind of a data uh, problem. I, I think that's an understatement, actually. We have a data disaster in the sense that, uh, so the Center for World Indigenous Studies uh, recently did a report and found that there is virtually no reliable data on COVID uh, at the municipal levels, at the state levels, and even at the federal levels. Uh, the Center for Disease Control, which issued its own report uh, recently on COVID, uh, only was able to look at 27 different states out of, out of 50. And some of those states that were omitted were pretty notable, like uh, Navajo Nation in Arizona and some of the other indigenous nations in Arizona and New Mexico. So, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at the Center for Disease Control as a, as a barometer for really a lack of coordination, a lack of understanding of what's actually going on in indigenous territories and indigenous places, uh, both in urban spaces and, and on, on reserve. The, um, the other thing I wanted to mention is just within my own nation. So within Cherokee Nation, uh, we've been hit hard, but not as hard as some of the other nations in Oklahoma. And so we have over 1300 cases right now that are active and about 10 deaths, uh, but the most uh, kind of the most rapidly increasing demographic for COVID in Cherokee Nation is between 18 and 35. And we're, we're seeing that in other places as well. Uh, one of the things that our nation's done, and I, I, you know, I think it's been really effective in expressing this notion of gadugi or community camaraderie uh, that is not letting any one person suffer on their own or engage in a challenge on their own is we provided uh, food plans for elders and for families in need. So as of today, you know, there have been over 73,000 different uh, meals and food plans that have been provided to elders and to, to other families in Cherokee Nation uh, since the pandemic began. Uh, and then even uh, considering different, and we have a huge nation, by the way, you know, we have 380,000 people, but uh, not all those people, of course, live in Oklahoma a lot, or like me, who have been dispersed to places like California and, and to other places. So we had kind of a second wave of, uh, of removal in the 1930s, and that's continued to, to change. So um, also providing 
assistance to people outside the territory, outside of our, our territory in Oklahoma has, has also been a factor. And so, you know, just as John mentioned, there's a lot of, of um, devastating impacts. Uh, and I think everyone's mentioned that uh, in terms of mental health, in terms of op opioid addiction, in terms of, uh, you know, violence within uh, within homes, that's gendered violence, that's violence against trans and two-spirited peoples. Um, so we need to be aware of that. Uh, but on on all fronts too, there's been uh, this amazing uh, assertion of self-determining authority. And there's been an amazing, I guess, expression of our values and our, and our needs um, in, in very innovative ways. So one of the ways in which I've, I've kind of looked at this, you know, since March as we started this, um, this page on Instagram, just called Everyday Indigenous Resurgence. And the idea was we would just highlight uh, different ways that people are engaging in everyday actions to promote their health and well-being. And so that's a very small thing, but it's, it's been really interesting to see uh, people from different communities host the page and talk about some of their difficulties, but also talk about the ways in which they have engaged in food security, food sovereignty uh, amidst this pandemic and sharing recipes, sharing knowledge, sharing stories of resilience uh, so that other folks can take heart and can uh, be inspired. So uh, what oh for having me on this and, and it's been great to hear all the panelists speak. Thanks, Jeff, for that. And, and as you say, that sharing of, of knowledge and, and the different kinds of practices, I think, is, is really important, really helpful for people in terms of supporting uh, well-being of Indigenous communities. Um, I, I just want to come back to, just very quickly, to a few issues, and particularly, I want to come back to Courtney, because um, one, of the, one of the things that, that some of the other panel members have picked up on or spoken about, Courtney, is um, th th these issues around mental health or, or some of the other issues that have been perhaps exacerbated by um, by the COVID-19 or, or the, the restrictions that have been in place around um, in response to COVID-19. And I know one of the issues that you or some of the issues that you work on are particularly focused around thinking about Indigenous women, Indigenous um, children, families, um, and, and, and particular parts of indig Indigenous communities. Um, who, who may be particularly impacted in some of these areas. And I just wondered whether you had any comments about uh, on that issue of, of those broader issues of well-being um, and how, how Indigenous communities might be responding in, in this area. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to turn So I'm in my car because I live on a reserve that does not have equitable access to internet. And so I travel away from my community to be able to get internet access. So uh, meet my Tucson. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of different inter interrelated issues that impact, you know, not only community's ability to extend care, uh, but to also be able to plan and, and consider how they are responding to um, different parts of our communities that might need exceptional or specific help. So one of the things that's really stuck out for me, especially within Canada, is just how significant the outbreak and severe outbreak was in long-term care homes. So uh, in Canada, about over 80% of the deaths that have occurred in Canada have been in long-term care homes. And this is a significant kind of service gap for First Nations. A lot of urban Indigenous people who are not able to live independently on reserve have to leave their community in order to access end of life care. And so we see a lot of older people, you know, especially older women, uh, having to move to towns and cities outside of their community in order to uh, have care extended to them. Um, I know of at least one case of an Indigenous person who um, did die in a long-term care facility outside of their community that wasn't included in any of the federally reported uh, data um, and suspect there are likely more where that wasn't um, reported. Um, we also don't know about any um, cases that are happening 
uh, within secure custody. So of course, Indigenous people are overrepresented, um, over incarcerated and criminalized. And so bands are not being made aware of any of their members who are in long term or in secure custody who have uh, contracted COVID-19. Uh, specifically for Six Nations, you know, we have um, a number of our members who are in one particular facility and uh, because of additional COVID restrictions um, that are limiting their access to um, time outside of their cells, um, you know, having no access to yard time or group settings, congregate settings, um, have actually uh, begun hunger strikes. And the bands are not being made aware of their members who are experiencing these um, uh, COVID-related human rights um, violations while they're in secure custody. Um, there's also been an Indigenous woman, uh, Joelle Beaulieu, who has fought, who did contract COVID-19 while she was in secure custody. And uh, she's launched a class action lawsuit on behalf of incarcerated women for the federal government's failure in responding to their, their specific needs and failing to protect them um, while they're in custody uh, from contracting this illness. So um, I think that there are some issues around, you know, freedom of, you know, freedom of information or, or how do communities actually become aware of um, you know, how they're able to best support those very vulnerable people, especially when, um, you know, we're not seeing data being released um, in, you know, long-term care facilities and uh, incarc for incarcerated people, but then also for young people who might be living in urban settings in group homes or in foster care, group foster care situations. So none of that's being made available to communities and they're not able to plan or, or extend care in those instances. So that's pretty alarming. Um, and I've seen many communities make those specific requests and, and not have that information shared with them. Thanks for that, that Courtney. Um, and you know, I think there are uh, certainly again just that really resonated with, with the experience here um, in Aotearoa thinking about the, the, the human rights implications for Indigenous um, communities uh, in the context of what has been a, a kind of um, greatly extended coercive state powers in particular too. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple more points before we wrap up. So I wanted to just come back to, uh, to you, John, and, and thinking about, because all of the people on the panel have talked about issues around sovereignty and self-determination and, and different kinds of practices uh, for Indigenous communities there. And, you, you know, you talked about Indigenous laws and people turning back, turning to to draw on our, our ways of doing things as responses. But have there been particular challenges in terms of, um, in terms of giving effect to those in the context of a of a settler state um, and the authority that that the, the settler state is trying to exert. So there's always challenges in implementing law within a community and between communities, and that is again the work of law. And so just because that exists does not mean that indigenous law is not a force. But as we heard with the Haida example with the fishing lodges, that's an example of what's happening in other places where. Indigenous peoples express their authority on an issue, and then it's not necessarily uh, picked up, abided by, agreed upon by those that surround them. And then the question is, what are the mechanisms that you use to be able to uh, facilitate that recognition? And uh, they are legion. Um, the, the idea that it's a just fight or flight or freeze is not um, a productive. Um, sometimes you need to fight, sometimes you need to flee, and sometimes you need to freeze. Those are survival mechanisms, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity along the spectrum to uh, work to uh, find ways to uh, facilitate those laws. And so, um, you know, people are entering into direct negotiation. Uh, they, are, they are making uh, direct uh, declarations. Um, they are um, ministers of the crown, um, municipal um, officials that are coming to see and observe themselves what's happening. Um, there's, there is, uh, I think, a wide variety of things that are going on. But you're right, 
that it, within the settler state, it's just not automatic that law would be given force. And uh, indigenous peoples are finding that challenge in this instance. Uh, fortunately, um, they have wisdom behind them as indigenous peoples, as the garden example shows, as the example of uh, what Jeff was talking about shows, as Courtney's statistics show that there needs to be more information that we gather to be able to feed into the broader system of decision making. Um, but once you get that information, that doesn't mean that people will necessarily act on that properly. Um, you need to do the, the hard work of law, which is uh, multifaceted. Thanks, John. Um, and just coming to you again, Jeff, um, you talked a little bit about the uh, experiences with Cherokee Nation, and we, we are going to um, have a, a session in this series um, focused on experiences of Indigenous peoples in the United States. But I was just wondering whether you, um, particularly thinking about the the kind of ideas of, of self-determination and exercise of indigenous sovereignty, um, whether, whether you, as someone working in Canada, uh, whether you had any, uh, are there any kind of differences you see um, in, in, the, in the ability of, of uh, or the ways in which indigenous communities are, are asserting their practices of sovereignty or self-determination um, between those two different uh, settler jurisdictions? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question. I think, um, I think in some ways, you know, the, that spectrum that John spoke about is, is there in, in so many different indigenous nations across Turtle Island, regardless of the, the colonial context. And, you know, for Cherokees, for example, we just, uh, you know, got the results of this big Supreme Court case, which makes over half of Oklahoma um, basically a reservation land. And so while that started to, to focus on initially on criminal jurisdiction, uh, especially for Indigenous peoples committing crimes against Indigenous peoples on those, those lands, I could see that expanding in terms of taxation, in terms of zoning. And so I think, I think there's, um, there's a lot of different ways that, uh, that indigenous peoples in the states uh, will try to leverage different levels of government. And, you know, again, it's very similar ways around, um, around jurisdictional claims, around, uh, you know, in the Cherokee Nation, you know, we have this huge budget. We just submitted over a billion dollars to the state of Oklahoma. So there's this, this, you know, this state indigenous um, level of interaction that may be different than, let's say, provincial and First Nation and, you know, and Métis interaction, right? So I think we see, uh, we see different expressions of self-determination, but they're all at their core about asserting that uh, that ability to to determine what happens on your territory, um, and so I, I, I'm not addressing this really clearly, but it's really just to give you a sense that um, you know these uh, these forms of food insecurity, these forms of of even mental illness and mental challenges, uh, these forms of even the pandemic disproportionately affecting. Navajo Nation and some of the Pueblos, even Ho Chunk, right? Those are those are things that carry over into uh, into other settler states in this in the sense that they're they're treated very similarly, either with a lack of uh, a lack of knowledge or a lack of data, as we saw, and so ultimately a lack of accountability, uh, or uh, complete you know distrust or marginalization, right? And so it's it's ultimately our I guess resilience, our strength to express these things on our own terms. Great, thanks. Uh, and, and finally, I just want to come back to you, Jess, um, because you know you gave a really great example of of the experiences of your community learning through 
one set of challenges and then being able to, uh, to, to think about how those might apply to this, these new challenges we're facing. And I just wondered whether you had any, any kind of final thoughts about um, maybe advice or suggestions or what, what are the things you think that, that have, um, have helped you to, what are the things you've learned about um, making that experience work well yeah, so, you know, for me, the question I keep coming back to as I think about how to carry this work forward is, you know, asking myself, where does the power come from? Um, so many of these situations, whether it's, you know, oil spills, pandemics, um, they make us feel powerless. You know, how do we bring that power back? What makes us feel powerful? The affirmation and the support, quite frankly, does not come from settler governments. It doesn't come from anyone outside coming in and doing things for us. The power comes from us doing things for each other. You know, everybody on this panel has shared such incredible um, examples of why that is important. And, you know, if the provincial and federal government um, cannot align with the laws of Indigenous nations, do you know who is upholding and affirming them? Helsic. Helsic is upholding Newhawk law and Wikino law and Kitasu law and you know the Haida law of our peace treaty brothers and sisters, the people who are all around us in the way that we carry ourselves in relation to those surrounding nations in this time. And all of them are upholding our law in the way that they interact with us. And so, you know, when you look at mutual aid, either in the context of a community and community care or across communities, uh, that's where the power comes from. And that power and resilience, I, I firmly believe, can carry us through anything. And I am so grateful for the ways in which the power of other people lent to me has helped me to get through this situation. And um, that's a gift that I think we just all need to continue giving one another. Great, thank you, Jess. And, and I think that's a really great place to finish up our conversation here. Um, I, I really want to thank all of you for, again, being willing to, to take the time and to share your experiences and your knowledge um, and the stories of your communities. Uh, and I, um, just it's, as, as a, a small kind of thanks to you all, um, we're going to plant we're gifting um, funding to a, a native tree planting uh, program here in Aotearoa and we're going to, uh, get, there'll be a native tree planted in, in, in each of your names um, as part of that program, just as a, a small thank you for, uh, for your time and, and your, your knowledge and sharing that with us. Uh, so I'll just close now with uh, Karakia. Te whakaia tanga e, te whakaia tanga e, tēnei te kaupapa ka ea, tēnei te wānanga ka ea, te mauri o te kaupapa ka whakamuia, te mauri o te wānanga ka whakamuia, koa ki runga, koa ki raro, haumie, huie, tā i ki e. Kia ora koutou. <laughs>